Welcome to my channel. I will tell you the story of Churchill in three consecutive videos. This is the first video. Thank you for watching and subscribing. Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill came into this world far too early, born as he was on the 30th of November, 1874, in a small ground floor bedroom at Blenheim Palace. Now Blenheim Palace was no ordinary manor, but a grand monument to his ancestor John Churchill, the first Duke of Marlborough, who had won a pivotal victory against the French over a century prior. This Baroque palace, styled after Versailles with its seven acres of rooms and massive facade, commemorated military glory and Winston's noble lineage. Though premature by over a month, Winston was by all accounts a healthy babe with a fine set of lungs. He caused quite a scare for his parents, however, the American beauty Jenny Jerome and Lord Randolph Churchill, a rising star in British conservative politics. Jenny had taken a nasty fall and endured a bumpy carriage ride in the days before Winston's birth, which brought on early labour. But mother and son pulled through those worrying first days thanks to vigilant care. Lord Randolph affectionately described Winston as wonderfully pretty as an infant, with dark eyes and hair. In those early years at Blenheim, Winston toddled through opulent halls surrounded by tapestries and paintings celebrating Marlborough's conquests. In this August setting, young Winston absorbed a sense of his family's legacy and his duty to live up to it. Now Winston's family had an illustrious name, but modest means, at least by the standards of the British upper crust. Lord Randolph could not count on inheriting much as the younger son of a duke. And while Jenny's father had once been fabulously wealthy as the King of New York, his fortune crumbled in a Great Wall Street crash. Still, Jenny and Randolph married for love in Paris when they were just 20 and 24. Neither had a large income or estate, but between the Duke and Mr. Jerome's contributions, they had enough to live as fashionable London newlyweds. Or so they thought. Turns out Randolph and Jenny shared an enthusiasm for spending that outpaced their limited budget. As Winston rather understated years later, we were not rich, I suppose we had about £3,000 a year, and spent 6000 Though occasionally strapped for cash, the Churchills moved in the most elite social circles. Young Winston grew up attending all the right schools and colleges before embarking on a military career befitting his station. He spent weekends and holidays at the country houses of Dukes and Earls, Rothschilds and ASDs. At Blenheim Palace most of all, Winston came to see himself as part of that noble caste who guided the fortunes of the nation. Far from being a snob, however, Winston befriended both high and low-born companions over the years. He chafed at silly rules of hierarchy and etiquette as only one utterly secure in his position could do. Why, this boy had never dialed a phone or boiled an egg. Still, his patrician air intimidated common folk and potentates alike when necessary for Winston was raised to believe it was his duty to shepherd Britain to greater glory, just as the first Duke of Marlborough had shaped history. This profound sense of confidence and responsibility was perhaps Winston Churchill's greatest inheritance. It steeled his resolve when his judgment failed him, as it occasionally did even in youth. You see, Lord Randolph was a bold but reckless politician in the Disraeli mould, the Benjamin Disraeli who had dominated conservative politics a generation prior. Lord Randolph coined the slogan, trust the people, and blazed his own path to power, ruffling feathers in the process. Sound familiar? Winston idolized his magnetic yet volatile father and adopted his politics as his own. So while Winston wore his privilege lightly when it came to befriending both high and low-born people, he firmly believed in the right of his class to rule. Yet unlike many aristocrats of the time, Winston felt a profound obligation to the people his class governed the same working folks his father had championed under the banner Tory democracy. This was the essence of Winston Churchill's worldview, as shaped by dear old Blenheim Palace with its August heritage. The notion that with his privileged upbringing came tremendous responsibility to family, party and nation, and the self-assurance required to fulfill such responsibility in the glare of public life. This was Winston's birthright, a mixed blessing in the trials ahead. Thank you for watching Churchill's story, this is the first video, there will be a second and third video after that. Please follow my channel to continue watching Churchill's story, if you like this video please like and retweet. When Churchill was 20 years old, the British Empire was at its peak, spanning over one-fifth of the Earth's land. The British Navy ruled the seas, London was a great port city, 
and the constitution seemed secure, although some distant colonial disputes lurked. To Churchill, the late Victorian imperial world appeared permanent as long as people like him dedicated themselves to its service. After his father died, Churchill was left with a sizable inheritance of over five million pounds in today's money. In the short term he relied on his mother Jenny for income, and their relationship grew closer, almost like siblings. As a new cavalry officer, Churchill loved the pomp and camaraderie, although he saw soldiering as merely a path to his true calling, politics. He prescribed himself for years of army life to build his reputation before entering the political arena. Eager for medals and adventure, Churchill secured a posting as a war correspondent with the Daily Graphic to cover the Cuban Revolution against Spanish rule. He persuaded a fellow officer, Barnes, to join him. Before departing, British intelligence asked them to gather information on new Spanish bullets. This was Churchill's first intelligence mission. Jenny paid for his passage, but he needed more funds. Churchill quickly learned to manage creditors and finances in aristocratic fashion despite his proximity to Blenheim Palace. Journalism provided income as his mother's extravagant lifestyle and affair with the Prince of Wales strained her resources. Writing sharpened his prose and trained him to hold readers' attention, talents evident in his later speeches. In New York, Churchill stayed with Brooke Cochran, an admirer of Jenny's. Cochrane profoundly influenced Churchill's speaking style and political ideology over the next decade. He taught me to use every note of the human voice as if playing an organ, Churchill later wrote. Arriving in Cuba, Churchill won his first medal and sympathized with the rebels against Spanish imperialism. He relished the danger, writing, here I might leave my bones. After returning from Cuba, Churchill continued excelling as a soldier while yearning for action. In India during 1897-98, he sharpened his instincts for guerrilla warfare and honed his writing habits, keeping up a lively correspondence. Through daring exploits like polo matches, he gained notice from superiors, which helped excuse his extracurricular activities. During leave in London, Churchill witnessed debates in Parliament, his ultimate aspiration. When rumours brewed of a British expedition to quell rebellions in Egypt and Sudan, Churchill leveraged his connections shamelessly, including writing the Prime Minister to gain assignment. In August 1898, he joined the 21st Lancers in Cairo. The regiment charged in the climactic Battle of Andaman, avenging the death of General Gordon 14 years prior. Churchill killed several men in the frenzy of combat. Afterwards, he explored enemy sites, pocketing souvenirs like the Mahdi seal despite orders. His vivid account of Andaman in the morning post cemented his fame. He returned to England a decorated hero and best-selling author at age 24. He socialized in aristocratic circles and wooed Pamela Plowden, though she later married another. Never staying idle, Churchill ran unsuccessfully for Parliament in 1899 before departing as correspondent to cover the Boer War in South Africa, determined to fight not just right. But within weeks, he was captured. As a civilian prisoner of war, Churchill's dairy escape made global headlines. He slipped through a bathroom window and scaled perimeter fences before hiding on a train. Despite a bounty on his head, he travelled over 300 miles to freedom in Portuguese East Africa. I do not wish to be taken alive, he wrote to the Boer Secretary of War. The exhilarating triumph tempered the shame of his capture. Returning home in 1900, Churchill campaigned vigorously before winning a seat in Parliament, the first run of political power he had targeted since leaving school. Thank you for watching Churchill's story, this is the first video, there will be a second and third video after that. Please follow my channel to continue watching Churchill's story, if you like this video please like and retweet. By August 1898, Churchill was in Cairo, eager to join Kitchener's forces marching on Khartoum. After a treacherous journey across the desert, he reached Kitchener's headquarters. When the Anglo-Egyptian army advanced, Churchill was sent to report that 50,000 dervish warriors were approaching. Churchill estimated Kitchener had an hour before battle would be joined. The dervishes halted at Andaman. Churchill rejoined his regiment and was thrown a bottle of champagne by a gunboat commander, a welcome respite before the next day's battle. As night fell, the young officers amused themselves by reciting nursery rhymes to keep spirits high. At dawn, 
Churchill read it himself. The 21st Lancers charged the last great British cavalry charge. Churchill, commanding a troop, realized they were outnumbered ten to one. He saw flags appear from a depression crowned with hidden men. Churchill curved his troop to strike the dervish flank. Galloping at full speed, he reached the dervishes and shot for a close range before the Khalifa's men fled. Churchill was unnerved, feeling as cool as now. But the charge took a toll, a quarter of the regiment were casualties. Churchill later lamented the dervishes destroyed, not conquered, by machinery. After victory, Kitchener desecrated the Mahdi's tomb despite Churchill's protests. Churchill confided his suspicions that Kitchener had pretended to return the Mahdi's head when he likely kept it. Churchill described Kitchener as a vulgar common man. The memory of Andaman's brutality stayed with Churchill. In Cairo, Churchill volunteered skin for a graft to save an injured officer, undergoing the surgery without anaesthetic. My sensations justified his description, Churchill later remarked. Back in London, Churchill continued wooing Pamela Plowden to no avail, despite proclaiming his constant love for her. She later refused his proposal. No sooner had Churchill returned home than he started writing The River War. He aimed to set the record straight on Kitchener's misconduct. While Polo kept him busy, his heart was still set on becoming a Tory MP. Through luck and the aid of political allies, he won in Oldham. In Parliament, Churchill soon stood out for his combative speaking and attacks on the Conservatives. But his party loyalty found limits when the Boer War erupted. Though he sailed to South Africa as war correspondent, he soon asked to join the 21st Lancers. Once in combat, he took charge after senior officers were killed, leading 150 men to safety. This escape made him a national hero. Though the Boer War brought fame, Churchill still faced financial worries. He turned to the lecture circuit, where his war exploits and oratory skill drew large, paying crowds. By the war's end, he had achieved both financial security and a reputation to mount a new bid for office. Churchill's second parliamentary run was far smoother. He won in Manchester as a Conservative. Yet just two years later, ethical qualms over the Conservatives' tariff policy pushed him to change parties. This ratting earned him the lasting enmity of hardline Tories. As a Liberal MP, Churchill began his rise in power by supporting progressive causes. With his gift for vivid speech, he championed issues like prison reform and workers' rights. In 1908, he entered the cabinet as head of the Board of Trade at just 33, the youngest cabinet member in years. When the Navy needed funding cuts in 1910, the new First Lord of the Admiralty had a bold idea, convert the Navy to oil power. Though controversial, Churchill's drive to modernize was vindicated in wartime. The switch allowed ships to stay at sea longer without costly coal. By 1911, the same restless energy that had pushed Churchill from Cuba to India now brought him and his wife Clementine a new adventure, learning to fly. Mastering the air, Churchill believed, would be vital to any future war. But global tensions were already building to crisis. Thank you for watching Churchill's story, this is the first video, there will be a second and third video after that. Please follow my channel to continue watching Churchill's story, if you like this video please like and retweet. Winston Churchill entered politics in 1900, when he was elected as a Conservative MP at the age of 25. Eager to establish himself, he embarked on lucrative lecture tours in Britain and North America, capitalizing on his experiences as a war correspondent during the Boer War. Though controversial, these tours earned him fame and fortune. Upon returning to Britain, Churchill took his seat in Parliament in February 1901. His witty maiden speech drew praise, though its call for magnanimity towards the Boers was controversial. Churchill joined a group of rebellious Tory MPs called the Hooligans, who challenged their party's leadership. In March 1901, the Secretary for War proposed expanding the army substantially. Sensing an opportunity to vindicate his father, Lord Randolph Churchill, who had resigned as Chancellor in 1886 over military spending, Winston prepared a bold rebuttal. In a brilliant speech, he called for military cuts to fund tax reductions instead. Churchill predicted that future European wars would be disastrous total wars, not limited affairs between professional armies. 
his speech was a sensation. Though he had challenged his party, Churchill's energy and intellect marked him out for promotion. By 1903, the new Conservative Prime Minister, Arthur Balfour, appointed him Under Secretary for the Colonies at just 29 years old. Yet Churchill grew restless under Balfour's cautious leadership. In 1904, Churchill crossed the floor to join the Liberal opposition, influenced by his friendship with Liberal leader Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman. As a Liberal, Churchill continued advocating progressive social reforms to improve living conditions for the poor. Many Conservatives saw his defection as an act of betrayal. For Churchill, it was a courageous if controversial decision that advanced his career significantly. When the Liberals won a landslide victory in 1906, Churchill was made Under Secretary for the Colonies. Now in government, he worked to advance Liberal policies. He played a key role in the Liberal welfare and trade union reforms that helped establish the modern social safety net. Churchill's energy and political courage powered his meteoric rise. By 1908, aged just 33, he entered Cabinet as President of the Board of Trade. An extraordinary career at the highest levels of British politics was only just beginning. The greatest chapters of Churchill's life still lay ahead. Thank you for watching Churchill's story. This is the first video. There will be a second and third video after that. Please follow my channel to continue watching Churchill's story. If you like this video, please like and retweet. In early 1906, Churchill was campaigning for election in Manchester as a Liberal candidate, having dramatically split from the Conservative Party. On New Year's Day, he published his election manifesto, forcefully critiquing the Tories' leadership. The next day, he published a biography of his father, Lord Randolph Churchill, for which he had received a large advance. The book portrayed his father as a populist hero who had fought against the establishment. Churchill's depiction was highly idealized, ignoring many of Lord Randolph's opportunistic political maneuvers and rude behavior towards colleagues. Churchill excised unflattering facts and quotes, instead recruiting his late father as a mental figure to justify his own split with the Conservatives. The book became a bestseller, though some questioned its accuracy. Publishing the rival texts back to back was a politically astute move as Churchill campaigned for election on a platform of deserting his former party. Churchill faced significant disruption from suffragettes, who targeted his high-profile campaign. When speeches were interrupted, he showed courtesy but refused to be a henpecked on the issue. He defended public speaking as a democratic right. Ultimately, Churchill declined to firmly support votes for women, alienated by the protests. He triumphed in the election as part of a landslide Liberal victory. Exulting, Churchill saw it as vindicating his father's populist spirit and cementing the Conservatives' fall from power. Upon becoming a minister in the colonial office, Churchill took a relatively pacifist imperial approach, skeptical of bloody punitive expeditions against rebellious native tribes. However, his sympathy for colonial subjects was sometimes overruled. Churchill also prioritized reconciliation with the defeated Boer republics. He had a surprisingly cordial meeting with Jan Smuts, a former Boer commando leader. Churchill proposed a fresh start between Britons and Boers with policies of impartiality. This was accepted by the cabinet. Beyond politics, Churchill was continuing his massive education in history and literature. He was writing more for periodicals to earn extra income. However, most of his time was consumed with ministerial duties and the extensive detail involved in colonial administration. While interested in technology and progress, Churchill romanticized the past as a golden age of adventure and heroics. Churchill's speaking skills were becoming renowned as he honed his rhetorical talents through constant public speeches on the campaign trail. His oratory was fueled by intensive reading of the classics which supplied a ready stock of literary allusions. He labored intensely over the crafting of his speeches. Churchill cut a striking visual figure with his imperial mannerisms and aristocratic ancestry. With his move to the Liberal Party, Churchill gained a new political identity distinct from his father while upholding Lord Randolph's populist legacy. His ministerial duties and writing developed his statecraft, while electioneering refined his public persona. Though proud of his individuality, Churchill was still haunted by the emotional pain of childhood and the memory of his late father. 
His life was underpinned by a romantic view of the past and faith in his own inspiring ambition. Thank you for watching Churchill's story. This is the first video. There will be a second and third video after that. Please follow my channel to continue watching Churchill's story. If you like this video, please like and retweet. In April 1908, Prime Minister Henry Campbell Bannerman resigned due to ill health and was succeeded by Herbert Asquith. Asquith offered the 33-year-old Winston Churchill the post of President of the Board of Trade, making him the youngest cabinet minister in 40 years. Churchill had to deal with major strikes amidst economic downturn. Before taking office, he had to stand for re-election per a constitutional requirement. Despite exhaustive campaigning, Churchill lost by 429 votes in a surprise defeat. His opponents rejoiced, considering him unreliable and immature. Though disappointed, Churchill's popularity allowed him to consider several safe seats propositioned to him. He accepted the Scottish working-class constituency of Dundee. To create a vacancy, the sitting MP was awarded a peerage. Churchill implied Scotland did not have the liberty of Ireland to seek home rule. This first step away from his father's pro-Irish views would continue. Throughout the Dundee campaign, Churchill was heckled by an Irish suffragette ringing a loud bell. He politely tipped his hat and left. Churchill attacked the unelected House of Lords and won the seat handily. Churchill and Clementine Hosier met at social events as romance bloomed. After his brother's wedding, a fire broke out at the country estate where Churchill was staying. He relished the fun and directed firefighting operations. Cruelly told Clementine had died, she was immensely relieved to receive Churchill's telegram he was safe. They arranged to meet at Blenheim Palace. There, Churchill proposed at the Temple of Diana despite oversleeping that morning. Though not wealthy, he felt confident she would accept. Delighted, he immediately told others despite promising secrecy. Churchill acknowledged Holier's poverty and pledged to give her a worthy station. With little money, the Churchills lived in his bachelor flat initially. I love you passionately, Clementine wrote in French, feeling less shy. He ecstatically replied love and joy possessed his being. They looked forward to marriage despite her warm, unlawned address. After Lord Salisbury's congratulations, Churchill joked about fleeing Britain if Salisbury disapproved. The couple married quietly, entering the prince's ice skating ring to avoid attention. They honeymooned in Bovina, Italy as Churchill studied Italian battlefields for a biography of his ancestor the Duke of Marlborough. Clementine soon became pregnant. Returning in January, Churchill prepared his first budget and legislation. He focused on poverty, an issue since reading Seabarn Roundtree's study of York. Proposing a progressive tax on high unearned incomes to fund social welfare programs, Churchill said taxes should extract more from those with a greater superfluity. His tax policies were controversial, but he succeeded at introducing labor exchanges and a minimum wage. Asquith said Churchill handled the job ably despite lacking finance experience. Churchill later wrote that dealing with unemployment and sweated trades were the most satisfying efforts of his career. In autumn 1909, Churchill focused on naval estimates and helped arrange Anglo-French naval conversations amidst worsening German relations. The Agadir crisis of 1911, where Germany challenged French control in Morocco, convinced him war was likely. He audaciously asked the Admiralty for naval control before being appointed First Lord in October. There he pushed for fast oil-powered ships and reorganized the department. Churchill struggled with finances despite strong public imperialist sentiment. Wanting a naval war staff against Admiralty resistance, he ingeniously put new planning operations in the Admiral's office, circumventing opponents. Churchill's innovations and energy began Britain's naval readiness for war. Thank you for watching Churchill's story, this is the first video, there will be a second and third video after that. Please follow my channel to continue watching Churchill's story, if you like this video please like and retweet. Winston Churchill began his job as Britain's Home Secretary in 1910, responsible for domestic security, the legal system, and prisons. One of his first painful duties was to review death penalty cases. He reprieved over half those presented to him, finding the decision-making deeply troubling. As he confided to a friend, having to judge whether a person should live or die had become a nightmare. 
Churchill supported the death penalty in principle, believing for most serious offenders that life imprisonment was a worse punishment. But he respected the courage of enemies who were sentenced to death, like the Indian revolutionary Manan Naudingra who assassinated a British official and said, the only lesson required in India at present is to learn how to die. Churchill called his last words the finest ever made in the name of patriotism. The job weighed heavily on Churchill. His nerves were frayed as he dealt with worries big and small, from commuting sentences to keeping public order during labor strikes. He found some remedy in writing down all his troubles to see which mattered most. His loyal undersecretary noted Churchill often burst in with adventurous or impossible ideas, but after much discussion, they usually devised something still bold but workable. One impossible idea was female suffrage. Churchill had initially favored giving property to women the vote. But facing opposition from colleagues, he made a dramatic about face. In a harsh speech, he claimed most women didn't want the vote and that giving it to some fallen women while denying blameless mothers was grotesque. He was lambasted for hypocrisy and making policy by catchy phrases, not conviction. The bill passed, but got no further. By contrast, Churchill's prison reform speech reflected his profound liberalism. Horrified by captivity from his own brief jailing years before, he eloquently argued that how prisoners are treated is a test of civilization. He worked to keep minor offenders out of jail and introduced music and libraries for those incarcerated. But Churchill was attacked when a burglar he had released offended again. His wife recalled the man resorted to theft whenever he hit hard times, claiming poor boxes in churches were for the poor, so obviously meant for him. Churchill lightened his worries that summer on a yacht cruise in the Mediterranean. He later told an aide that writing down all one's troubles showed many are trivial or irremediable, leaving only one or two worth concentrated effort. It was a coping mechanism he would use all his life. Returning to London, Churchill focused on the bitter dispute between the House of Lords and Commons that threatened to paralyze government. The core issue was the power of the aristocracy. As Home Secretary, Churchill had to oversee security and public order if the crisis led to chaos in the streets. Seeking to break the impasse, he proposed a coalition government embracing moderate reforms. But the Liberal and Conservative leaders rebuffed the idea of compromise. The Parliament bill to strip the Lord's veto moved ahead. Churchill believed the country needed not confrontation but consensus. Yet for now, the die was cast for political war. By year's end, an election was called to rally support. Churchill campaigned energetically for his Liberal allies, often facing heckling crowds. At one rowdy rally, he calmly said he could speak for hours if needed until they tired themselves out. His humor and refusal to be bullied won cheers even from opponents. The Liberals won a narrow victory. Churchill expected to stay on as Home Secretary. But he had alienated too many, including the King, who resented the way Churchill and colleagues had supposedly bullied his late father. When the post of First Lord of the Admiralty fell open, it was a perfect fit for Churchill's experience and love of the Royal Navy. Without regret, he left the Home Office after just one year. Looking back, Churchill's Home Secretary tenure was a mix of high ideals and harsh realities. He learned on the job while pursuing prison reform and balancing conflicting pressures on issues from strikes to suffrage. He followed his convictions though it cost support. Through the crises and criticism, he began developing skills in leadership tempered by human understanding. It was a valuable apprenticeship for the great struggles ahead. Thank you for watching Churchill's story, this is the first video, there will be a second and third video after that. Please follow my channel to continue watching Churchill's story, if you like this video please like and retweet. When he entered office, Churchill was tasked with radically changing the war strategy of the British Navy, then the most powerful in the world. And change it he did, along with many other aspects of the Admiralty. In the process, he made bitter enemies among the admirals who held great power and influence. By late 1913, all four sea lords were considering resignation because of Churchill's brash style. He lectured admirals decades his senior as if they were schoolboys. Having recently advocated for defense cuts, Churchill now aligned with the hawkish wing of the Liberal Party, supporting increased spending to counter the growing German threat. 
Of course, he was accused of opportunism, but Germany's actions leading up to 1914 certainly justified his change of heart. Churchill's key ally in reforming the Admiralty was the legendary Admiral Jackie Fisher, who had revolutionized naval construction as an earlier sea lord. Fisher fell head over heels for Churchill, captivated by his quick mind and grand visions. Their partnership, though incredibly fruitful, also sowed seeds of great rancor. Churchill's first major reform was creating a naval war staff for operations, intelligence, and planning, provoking bitter opposition. He forced the resistant first sea lord to resign. The new staff immediately began drawing up plans to transport the British expeditionary force to France in case of invasion. Churchill set about building powerful new battleships, the largest afloat, and increased naval spending substantially despite opposition. Churchill's great strategic insight was to shift resources from the Mediterranean to overwhelm Germany in the North Sea. This required faith from the French that Britain would protect the Channel ports. Churchill won over skeptics by arguing that Britain couldn't possibly hold both theatres with the Germans undefeated in the North Sea. Against resistance, his strategy was adopted and proved correct. Beyond strategy, Churchill introduced better pay and increased opportunities for promotion of sailors. He advanced talented young officers like Jenico and BT while sacking many older officers. He created the Naval Air Service, pioneering the bombing of enemy locations. He saw potential in submarines and code breaking, helping establish Room 40, the famous intelligence unit. Churchill toured naval facilities extensively, viewing exercises and pressing officers on many details. He bombarded the Prime Minister with long memos posing as chatty letters. He holidayed with Asquith and his daughters, though his talk of optimum gunnery range perplexed Violet Asquith even as it charmed her years before. In his whirlwind reforms at the Admiralty, Churchill left few stones unturned. He was dynamic, abrasive, visionary. By 1915, though the Admiralty was ready for war, Churchill had made enemies of many he called old fossils. But he believed, with his ally Fisher, that the Navy must move forward. And the outbreak of war would soon test all he had done at the Admiralty. The decisions he fought for would ring through the coming conflict, for good or for ill. Whatever might come, Churchill had unleashed his storm across the age-old institution. Things would never be the same. Thank you for watching Churchill's story. This is the first video. There will be a second and third video after that. Please follow my channel to continue watching Churchill's story. If you like this video, please like and retweet. Churchill was a dynamo when the Great War began. He set up an Admiralty War Group that met daily to discuss strategy. They agreed the Navy must transport troops to France, blockade Germany's fleet, and keep trade routes open. Churchill even dreamed of taking islands near Germany or landing an army there once France was stabilized. But overall organization of the war was haphazard with overlapping committees and no clear leadership from Asquith. When Germany invaded Belgium, Churchill immediately argued Britain must support her ally France on the continent. The British Expeditionary Force was soon transported across the Channel through a massive naval operation. Though the BEF ended up entrenched, Churchill had envisioned it acting as a mobile strike force. Churchill set up a Royal Naval Division as an infantry force under Admiralty control, separate from the regular army. It saw action in many bloody battles including Gallipoli. Some of Churchill's friends served and died in it. The division kept naval traditions and he later fought attempts to disband it. In late August, the German army nearly reached Paris but was finally halted at the Mon River. When Antwerp was threatened, Churchill stressed supporting the Belgians for strategic reasons, but his plan to supply the city by sea was rejected. The cabinet had no contingency plans. Churchill frequently visited the front and ports. On a trip to Scotland, he personally investigated a house he suspected of spying, though it turned out to be harmless. While he has been accused of paranoia, many German spies were operating in Britain. In a speech, Churchill said he hoped the Navy would confront the German fleet, but if they continued hiding, they'd be dug out like rats. This drew cheers, but establishment figures found it undignified. Churchill admitted it was foolish phrasing, but he never shied from revealing the harsh realities of war. So despite frictions with the War Office and Asquith's weak leadership, Churchill tackled the early days of the war with dynamism, vision and energy. 
he built new forces, transported troops to France and dreamed of bold naval strategies while keeping trade routes open. Antwerp may have represented a missed opportunity, but Churchill had at least urged supporting the Belgians. Though his rhetorical flair occasionally upset dignitaries, he galvanized popular sentiment. Thank you for watching Churchill's story, this is the first video, there will be a second and third video after that. Please follow my channel to continue watching Churchill's story, if you like this video please like and retweet. On March 18, 1915, a British French fleet under Rear Admiral John de Robeck attempted to force through the Dardanelles Strait but failed, with several ships sunk by mines. Churchill dismissed this as just a few worthless ships lost, but it was a major setback. At a war council the next day, opponents like Fisher said, I told you so, while Churchill wanted the Robert to persevere. But the council decided infantry should capture Gallipoli to enable another naval attack. Churchill assumed the Turks would be poor fighters, but they were vigorously preparing defences under German General Lyman von Sanders. The British planned an amphibious attack on the peninsula with inadequate troops and little time. The Navy again failed to suppress Turkish beach defences, while Hamilton got some divisions ashore, but didn't capture key objectives like Chanak Bear. Casualties were high and evacuation was considered, but Hamilton ordered his men to dig in. This lack of success brought political attacks on Churchill, who was looking unwell and touchy according to Lloyd George. Doubts grew about the operation, though Churchill claimed the chances still favoured success. When Fisher leaked information to discredit him, Churchill did not realise the betrayal. Fisher even told Clementine Churchill was with a mistress in Paris, which she dismissed outright. Lacking support from Asquith and Lloyd George, Churchill was isolated. Though conspiracy theories blame him for the Lusitania sinking, he actually regretted that it didn't bring America into the war sooner. But politically he was finished. On May 19th, he had to resign as First Lord of the Admiralty. In 1917, the government was reconstituted under Lloyd George, but still without Churchill, leaving him in the political wilderness. He rejoined the army for distraction, before getting back into Parliament in 1916. But Gallipoli haunted him along with the deaths of so many bright young men like Rupert Brooke. When defending his record in Parliament, Churchill said the Dardanelles had been sound in principle, but errors were made in execution. In the post-war years, Churchill was confronted by angry friends and relatives of the Gallipoli dead. Seeking vindication, in 1923 he published The World Crisis, his epic history of the war, which was a bestseller in Britain and America. Though self-serving, it shaped perceptions of Gallipoli for years. Gradually Churchill rebuilt his career, returning to government in 1924 and becoming Chancellor in 1925 before his next wilderness period but the debacle would forever be associated with his name. Thank you for watching Churchill's story, this is the first video, there will be a second and third video after that. Please follow my channel to continue watching Churchill's story, if you like this video please like and retweet. Churchill was under no obligation to join the army and fight, but he resigned from politics and enlisted out of a sense of redemption and duty. As a minister, he had made mistakes regarding the Dardanelles and Gallipoli campaigns and felt he should serve his country as a soldier since he could not in politics. Upon arriving in France in November 1915, Churchill met with commanders who offered him a staff role, but he insisted on first spending time in the trenches to understand conditions there. He joined the 2nd Battalion of the Grenadier Guards, where he initially faced opposition for being a politician. However, through his charm and willingness to learn, he soon won over the officers and men. Churchill learned the routines and dangers of trench warfare, the endless artillery barrages, the cold and wet, the rats feasting on corpses. He saw many casualties yet felt a sense of happiness, release from cares, and contentment. One day when out on a long, unnecessary march in bad weather for a cancelled meeting, he returned to find his dugout destroyed by a shell that would have killed him. He took this as divine intervention and became fatalistic, feeling protected by destiny, Churchill met three figures in France who would later hold key roles for him, Louis Spears, a brave and decorated officer, Max Aitken, a businessman and politician, and Archie Sinclair, a Scottish aristocrat and grenadier officer. He was drawn to brave, gallant men and forged strong bonds with those who displayed courage under fire. Even when a young officer accidentally shot one of his own men, 
the others protected him and Churchill did not punish him harshly. A sense of indifference to death prevailed among the men. In London, Churchill's wife Clementine supported his decision to fight, though she worried for his safety. They exchanged many letters in which he told her details of life at the front and urged her not to fret over risks to him. She organized support for munitions workers and also advised Winston on maintaining his reputation despite the Dardanelles, trying to ensure he did not seem like a man seeking death out of grief. After several weeks in the trenches with the Grenadiers, Churchill returned to London in January 1916. He continued a correspondence with several officer friends and kept tabs on military decisions, including the difficult evacuation of Gallipoli, which despite his prior criticisms was executed skillfully. When his friend Louis Spears was wounded again, Churchill hailed him as a brave knight of legend. By May, Churchill had resigned his commission, feeling he could again be of service in Parliament. The weeks at the front had satisfied his sense of honour and duty. He had shared the soldiers' dangers and hardships firsthand, proving himself no mere politician. The bonds forged with fellow officers would last decades and influence his later leadership when Britain again went to war. Though but a brief chapter, his time fighting shaped Churchill's character and reputation for years ahead. Okay, that's all for this video first, next video we continue Churchill's story. Thank you for liking and subscribing. If you like this show, please forward it to your friends. Thank you.